welcome, welcome. So glad to see you this morning. Thank you for coming to this very, very special day. Number 52 in your songbooks. Let's stand as we sing it together. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. 52, standing as we sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. for being here today and I'll tell you what I've got mixed emotions about this uh, but um, thank you for thank you for being here and I'm looking forward to what the Lord is going to do uh, this morning as well and and Rikita how you doing all the way from Virginia God bless you and uh, great to have you and your mother with you you weren't able to be here last time were you when you're you were sick at home the mom mama was sick at home when your husband came to speak so I'm glad you could make it as well Thank you for being here. And so many loved ones here. Um, the Lord is good, isn't he? Remember to pray, if you would, for Joni Lawson, who was taken to the ER uh, this morning. And there's some concern, blood pressure and other issues. Remember that. But let's pray. Peter, it's great to see you as well. I'm glad you came. Thank you. Of course, I got my two ugly, I mean, my two good-looking brothers here, too. And, um, and then I've got the West Virginia delegation, some of the dearest folks in life. So let's pray. Father, as we come to you now, we thank you so much for how good you have been. Lord, I thank you for a faithful people. Thank you for people who love the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for a great group of deacons, Lord, that have uh, just been such a blessing to me personally, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for most of all, for what you have done at Grace Baptist Church, Lord, and the different uh, opportunities you've given us in the community, Lord, the different opportunities you give us to support missionaries all throughout the world. Now, I pray you'll be with this service and be with your servant, Lord, today. Uh, one of my favorite evangelists, though he's in the pastor today, he's got an evangelist heart, and Lord, he just loves you and loves your word. Bless him, Lord, and use him in a great way. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. 
So excited you could be with us this morning. This is a a bittersweet service for all of us as pastor retires and and moves on. Of course, a lot of you are visiting for that purpose. Our ushers are going to make their way down to the front. If this is your first time, even if you're only here for this uh, special service, what we'd ask you to do is raise your hand. Uh, We're going to pass some material to you. And inside this little packet, there'll be a visitor card. If you could fill that out. And uh, then in a few minutes, we'll pass an offering plate. You can put that in the offering plate. And uh, just so we can record your visit, know who was here. Um, Also, we do have a sign-up book there at the back table. Uh, So if you're a church member or a guest, we want anybody and everybody to at least sign in for your family. Uh, So just so this will be a special record for for Pastor on this retirement uh, service Sunday. If you have your bulletins, go ahead and pull those out real quick. As a church body, the first of the year, we established that we're going to learn the book of 1 John, or at least most of it, uh, together as a congregation. Um, 1 John chapters 1 through 4, we're on verses 8 through 10 this week. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, if we say that we have not sinned, We make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Reinforcing Romans 3.23, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. Some of us are saved by grace because we've received that free gift of eternal life. And our prayer is that each and every individual in here this morning understands what it means to have received that free gift. We don't want you to go away. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. You're surrounded by a bunch of imperfect people. But we serve a perfect God. We serve a gracious God. And one who is willing to forgive if we but ask. So just keep that in mind. Let's say the reference, those three verses, and then the reference is a congregation. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. First John 1, 8 through 10. And I trust if you haven't already grabbed one of those memorization schedules, we still have those in the back. Just checked yesterday. Make sure you grab one of those for you and your family. Uh, make it a point. Family devotions, just as a couple in the morning. Uh, recite, recite those verses each and every week, even if it's once a day, just as you're reading it. That'll just help that uh, aspect of God's word being instilled into your life. Uh, so... Hopefully that'll be something you'll commit to memory this week. Two things real quick. Uh, Don't forget, this coming Thursday, we have the ladies' dinner kickoff. We have had already a tremendous amount of you ladies that have signed up. If you've not already and you want to be a part of it, this Thursday, 6.30 in the Hanson Chapel. There's not going to be any uh, fees to to be a part of this. They're going to provide a a free meal. Uh, You don't hear that a whole lot from this pulpit. But just come out. We want you to have a good time. But make sure you put your name on that sign-up list so we uh, know how much to plan for. Also, today is the last day to sign up for couples retreat. We told you a couple weeks ago uh, that there was just a a limited amount of space for that. We've not quite hit our number, but if you have any intention in coming, that's February 28th, 29th up in Greenville. The cost is 150, but that covers the room. We usually have some snack items uh, even going into that evening, and then we give you the afternoon free so you can spend time with your spouse uh, that Saturday afternoon. So I trust you'll plan to be a part of that. Uh, Yes, sir. Well, there we go. It includes Friday night dinner, not just snacks, Friday night dinner and Saturday morning breakfast. So that's what you're getting uh, for that. Of course, we want to help out the speaker as well. Uh, He'll be with us that next Sunday. So we're excited to see what God's going to do that weekend with Brother David Snyder. Pastor Dave, if you would come introduce our next choir and orchestral song. We'll do. Picked uh, two of Pastor's favorite songs today. If you're wondering how you came up with those choir numbers. And so this next one we're going to do is Only God. It was our theme all last year. And we sang it just about once every month. Sometimes we sang it twice in a month. But uh, this has been one of Pastor's favorites, and so we're going to sing that now. Sing and play, Only God.
Woo, I get the goosebumps every time. Amen. Only God. You have a problem? Only God. You need a solution? Only God. You need help? Only God. Don't know what to do? Only God. That'll take care of all the problems. Only God. Amen. We're going to do something a little bit different today. It's going to be kind of different. Choir's going to come down. Orchestra's going to come down. Junior church, you're staying put. We're going to sing. Actually, we're going to just greet one another, get ready for the offering. Then we'll sing the song before we take the offering. But we'll have a hymn a little bit later that will allow you to be dismissed to junior church. It'll also allow you to be dismissed if you're going over to help serve and get ready for the meal after the service. So let's stand and greet one another, and we'll get ready for the offering. Let's sing it together. It's no longer I who liveth, but Christ who liveth in me. It's no longer I who liveth, but Christ who liveth in me. In me, in me, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I who liveth, but Christ who liveth in me. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your goodness, Lord. We thank you so much for blessing uh, these people and this ministry, Lord. And I pray that uh, the greatest days of Grace Baptist Church will be yet ahead. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.
Amen. This kind of is going to begin our special presentation area, and the Agar Dolls are going to come sing a couple songs for us. And then we'll have some presentations, and then they're going to have then we'll have a hymn, and then another special in the message. As I look back on this road I've traveled, I see so many times he's carried me through. If there's one thing that I've learned in my life, it's my Redeemer is faithful and true. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything His mercies are new, my Redeemer is faithful and true. My heart rejoices when I read the promise, there's a place that I'm preparing for you. No, someday I'll see my Lord face to face, cause my Redeemer is faithful and true. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything He has said, He will do. And He will morning His mercy. And in every situation, He has proved His love for me. When I lack the understanding, more grace He gives to me.
source of light and truth and grace. I know the fount of all forgiveness, who pours out life through saving faith. Pastor Brian Sams uh, aptly noted in a letter that he sent to Pastor Bill uh, that only one out of ten pastors retire as pastors. So this morning we are at an unusual, we are in an unusual situation. Rarely does it happen. Our purpose is to give glory to God while we thank a man and his wife for nearly a half century of service and that he has seen fit to allow Pastor Bill to retire as a pastor. If you noted in your bulletin, there was a review of the timeline. Pastor Bill's ministry began at Southside Baptist Church in Greenville 45 years ago. Uh, I actually attended that church a few times and I remember he looked a lot younger. <laughs> But so did, so did I and so did the rest of the people that I'm friends with under the ministry of late Dr. Walt Hanford. And uh, there were other friends of this ministry. Dr. Frank Garlock was there, I believe, at that time, as well as Dr. Fremont and uh, one of our missionaries for many years, Major Ron Brooks. And those folks were dear friends, many of them gone home to be with the Lord now. And I actually believe that uh, Dr. Bud Stedman was there for at least a year in that period of time, and he's currently the director of Baptist World Missions. Of course, we have the privilege of having his daughter here uh, working with us in the ministry, and we thank the Lord for her. Two church plants followed that three-year stint at Southside, uh, one of those in Woodruff, South Carolina, and then uh, in Lawrence, Kansas. As was mentioned earlier, Several folks here representing uh, the ministry of Twin City Bible Church in Nitro, West Virginia. Uh, pastor was there uh, after these church plants and then until he came to serve us here in 2007. And so uh, we've put together, and I thank Brandon for the work, putting together a little video that would uh, trace some of those steps. Probably should track, probably should tra uh, thank Mrs. Eggerdahl because I think she provided uh, what Pastor Bill probably think was ammunition, but it was actually just pictures. 
uh, that will uh, share a little bit of that, uh, uh, those 45 years of ministry with us. Brandon, we appreciate it. I have, my wife and I have been having an absolutely wonderful time. We moved into our house yesterday, all of our furniture is back in West Virginia. We're going to, and so we had our first night there and then I got lost this morning coming here. I, I did real good last night. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I took all the roads and we got to our house and I said, honey, we're going to run by the church. And I showed her where Zagsby is and right across the way is Bilo and then and I took her by the church. We picked up some things there. And, and then this morning, I saw the full view of Mineral Springs area. <laughs> it is the word that brings salvation and brings consecration. And the way you keep straight, the way you get straight is by believing the word of God. And the way you stay straight is by getting into the word of God. That's exactly what it says. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, this is the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. If you are not into the word of God, saturating your soul on a daily basis, you're going to forget how you're supposed to act and live as a Christian. Amen. And that's one of the problems we have. My darkness, Jesus found me, touched mine eyes and made me see. Broke sin's chains that long had bound me, gave me life and liberty. O oh, glorious love of Christ, my Lord divine. Stoop to save a soul like mine through all my days, and then in heaven above, my song will silence never. I'll worship him forever and praise him for. 
for his glorious work. Oh, amazing truth to ponder. He who angels host attend. Lord of heaven, God's son, what wonder. He became the sinner's friend. Oh, oh glorious love, love of Christ, my Lord divine, that made him stoop to save a soul like mine. Through all my days and then in heaven above, my song will silence never. I'll worship him forever. Praise him for his glorious love. My song will silence never. I'll worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love. And praise him for his glorious love. And praise him for his glory. But you know something? I'm excited about these days ahead. I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do. And I'm not finished. You perhaps noticed in your bulletin uh, some excerpts. Uh, we invited some of pastor's friends in the ministry over a number of years to uh, join us if they could, but we knew many of them can't. Uh, they have ministries going this morning. It's uh, a little different. Uh, they can't uh, lay down their week's work, uh, but uh, many of them responded with letters. By the way, Pastor, we have those letters for you folks, and we'll give them to you. Uh, from your friends. Um, but I thought it was interesting. Two pastors, a Bible college president, an evangelist, and two mission board directors responded to us. And those were the people that were uh, partners in ministry with Pastor Bill and Miss Vicki. These men have known, with, known him, worked with him, shared their hearts and their hurts with him, and uh, they prayed with him. And uh, these letters easily identified some traits of his ministry. And uh, I'll call just two or three of these to your attention. First of all, faithfulness. One reminded us that it is required in stewards, Paul told the Corinthians, that a man be found faithful. And we thank you for being faithful. Influence. Comments repeated in these letters use the words influence, mentor, and several noticed, noticed that they were better servants for having worked with and have known uh, the Eggerdals. And missions, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The letters mentioned your zeal to win souls. And of course, our speaker this morning, who is very real, in a very real sense stands before us as a direct result of your ministry. And then missions to the uttermost part of the earth. Two letters are from directors of mission boards of which Pastor Bill currently serves BIMI and Baptist World Mission. And then we have one other person that could not be here this morning but wanted to send a message. He submitted a video message. Uh, I surmised that uh, the other men were too old to know how to use video. Uh, uh, that's just a surmising on my part. But uh, the, uh, uh, there's a video message we'd like to share with you this morning uh, that we received. Brandon, you can share it with us. Hi, Bill and Vicki. Hi, congratulations. We're excited for you on this day and the recognition of your faithfulness and ministry. We also would like to say hello to all the members there at Grace Baptist Church in South Carolina. We're speaking to you from Denver, Colorado. And of course, this is Diane. This is Vicki's sister. 
And you can tell that Bill and I both married over our heads. That's true. And we have a phenomenal mother-in-law. And we like to say hi to her as well. But hi, just, a, just, a, just a couple thoughts. Bill and Vicki, I think what, what I think of when I think of you as a couple is your incredible love. Your love for God, your love for his word, your love for the gospel, your love for each other and for your family and for the, the people that God has entrusted to your care. And even the people that are hard to love, you love. And I think that when you talk about the many things that have been accomplished are great, but for us, it's what drives that. And the love of the Lord has always been the thing that I think of, first of all, when I think of both of you. And I'm so thankful to have a sister that um, I admire and whose example I, I really want to follow. And I want to be like you, Vicki. Um, I've watched you growing up all through childhood, adulthood, all through your ministry. You've done hard things and uh, you've been faithful through them all. I'm so thankful for a brother-in-law and a sister that we can look to and be inspired by. You've been great friends, great inspiration to us. We look forward to seeing what God has for you next. This retirement is just the end of this section of life, but we expect many great things in the future. So enjoy Amen. the day and give thanks to the Lord. Love you. Love you. I appreciate Matt taking time to, to respond to us, and we, uh, we thank the Lord for that. If you have your Bibles handy, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, is an, an interesting book. And no, I'm not the preacher today. But if you would, I would ask you to indulge me for just a minute as we prepare uh, the last portion of this uh, presentation. <clears throat> the church at Thessalonica is sometimes called the model church. In this context, chapter 2 is a message from a model servant. And if you would allow me, I want to read the portion of these verses, but I want to change our perspective this morning. In this chapter, Paul is writing to a church. I'm going to reverse our perspective this morning, and I want to offer back from a church a perspective back to Pastor Bill and to Ms. Vicki. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if we reverse the perspective, would read something like this. Brethren, we know your entrance into us, that it has not been in vain. But even after that you have suffered before and were shamelessly entreated, there were, uh, you were bold in, in our God to speak unto us the gospel of God with much contention. For their exhortation has not been of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as they were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so they spoke, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries their heart. For neither at any time used they flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought they glory, neither of us, neither of other, or nor of others, when they might have been burdensome as the apostles of, of Christ. But they were gentle among us, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of us, they were willing to have imparted unto us not the gospel only, but also their own souls, because we were dear unto them. For we remember, brethren, their labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because they would not be chargeable unto any of us, they preached unto us the gospel of God. We are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably they have behaved themselves among us that believe. As we know how they exhorted and comforted and charged every one of us, as a father doth his children, that we would walk worthy of God, who hath called us, unto his kingdom and glory. And I'll jump down to verse 19. For what is their hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even we 
in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For we are their crown, or they're their glory and joy. Pastoring a church is an unusual occupation. There's not many of them. Not many that retire as a pastor. And you are laboring for a different reward. And we serve as the reward for their labor. Many of you, some from other states, were the reward that God provides for them. We at his coming. And so I, with those thoughts in mind, I would uh, like to ask Pastor Bill, Miss Vicki, if they'd please join us on the platform. And... Uh, We have a couple of token gifts for our appreciation for your faithfulness to the ministry. Uh, we want to, uh, to share with, with the Eggerdahls. Uh, they've invested 45 years in influencing people. And for the past 12 and a half years, they've influenced us. We have token gifts from the church that come from our love and appreciation. Uh, to them, and uh, we'll take this time to share with them. Just a, I'll ask Brandon to put a picture of uh, Pastor Bill, uh, always invested into missions. And uh, he'll enjoy a token as he goes, uh, a reminder that his labor has not been in vain in the Lord. We also want to uh, give honor to whom honors do. Uh, you have family and friends that you will undoubtedly want to visit. Uh, I hear from a birdie that uh, you might already have an itinerary or two described or, or planned for you. And I hope you'll go with enjoyment. And so from your family at Grace Baptist Church, we'll present you with a, a love gift that uh, we trust will serve you folks well. As soon as we have a congregational hymn, uh, during the congregational hymn, our folks from the junior church and others that have obligations can be dismissed. We'll have some special music. Uh, we'll have our message this morning from, uh, I want to say evangelist, but he's Pastor Brian Sams Amen. from River City Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, a number of months ago, when we first began to plan this day, I went to Pastor Bill standing here in the office, and I said, Pastor, I just have to ask you, uh, who would you like me to have come and preach to us that day? And I would, I would like to describe to you how quickly he answered me, but he really interrupted me because I was getting ready to ask another question, and he said, Brian Sams. And uh, Brian, in a real sense, is a display of what a ministry is about. And, uh, you know, sometimes you you forget that along the way of difficulties and trials, uh, the Lord always seems to give us a, a few nuggets and a few wonderful things. And uh, I thank the Lord for Brian's ministry. Uh, you'll enjoy him. If you don't know him, those of us that do will enjoy hearing him today. It's fitting that he should preach to us this morning. And so that'll follow just as soon as our music's done. Take your songbooks, if you would, please. Number 268. 
And uh, Junior Church, you can be dismissed as we start singing. Make sure you go out this lower door where you're supposed to. Uh, If you're in the congregation, young people, four years old through sixth grade, head on out this way. Head into Junior Church. You know where to go. And then uh, deacons and their wives and helpers, you can head over to the gym, get ready for the meal. 268. Once far from God and dead to sin, no light my heart could see. But in God's word, the light in me. Amen. Wonderful singing today. You can be seated. And uh, Chase and Mary are going to come and sing for us at this time. With my whole heart I humbly seek you. Now use my life, O Lord, I pray. I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure to find. Give wisdom to choices I make. Along every path that I take. So when I come life's race, well done, you will say. Your word has promised me the victory, and all I need to do is claim. Your strength to soar with wings as eagles, to walk, to run, and not to faint. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure to find. Give wisdom to choices I make along every path that I take. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure to find. Give wisdom to choices I make. Along every path that I take. So complete life's race well done you will say well done you will say well praise the Lord I enjoyed every minute of the service so far. How about you? Amen. Been a great day. Thank the Lord for it. And I was uh, honored to be asked some months ago to be here uh, on this Sunday. And I thought about it for about a half a second and then said that, yes, I'd be honored to be here. Um, I feel kind of like my wife, though, standing in her closet on Sunday morning, trying to figure out what she's going to wear at church and been trying to figure out what I would say this morning. 
I want to do three things, if I could. I would love to honor the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the only one worthy of all of this. Secondly, I'd like to uh, give honor to your preacher. And certainly that is due. And then thirdly, I'd like to challenge you because that's what we've come here for today. So I want to say to the folks at Grace Baptist Church uh, what the woman and Shunammite woman said when she had Elijah or Elisha pass by her house on many occasions. She said to her husband, I perceive that a holy man of God passes us by continually. And that's what you've had for 12 and a half years here. He is a great pastor, a great preacher, but the truth of the matter is he's a better man than all those things. And so you've been blessed and too much is given, much is required. And to the deacons and leaders of the church who invited me to be here, thank you uh, for the distinct privilege to do so. Uh, to uh, Mary and Matt and your families, you have always been to me a tremendous testimony for your father and your father-in-law of what it means to faithfully follow God. And I admire your commitment to the Lord. Also, uh, Vicki, uh, I always hoped as I got saved and called to ministry that God would grace my life with someone like you. And he did. And I'm thankful. No one appreciates the burden that a pastor's wife carries like a pastor and understands what he has, she has to think about and deal with and sorrow through and Friends come and go along the way, but they stay faithful. And I appreciate the model, uh, pastor's wife, that you have been for years. Pastor Bill. There just aren't words to express how I feel about you. You know, they say that if you see a turtle on a fence post, there's one thing that you can be sure of. It did not get there by itself. And I've been standing on this fence post for 23 years. In May of 1997, I knelt in the carpet of a Sunday school class at 101st Avenue in Nitro, West Virginia, with your preacher, and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I was baptized the very next Sunday. And I began to follow Christ as his disciple. And that summer I was admonished by the pastor to just read the Bible. As you saw him challenge you evidently on his first Sunday here some years ago. I said, pastor, where should I read? Because I didn't really know much about the Bible. I, I thought Job was Job. I always got nervous when he preached from some Old Testament minor prophet because I was certain to get lost and felt embarrassed because I needed the table of contents when all the church kids memorized the patch song about the Bible. And I didn't know that song. So when he said, turn to Hosea, I was uh, lost. It took me a long time to find that, but I quickly began to learn and grow and read through the Bible multiple times that summer going into Bible college. I remember the first summer I had an opportunity to preach 
It was at an event that our church had where uh, high school students and junior high students had a basketball league at our church. And every, every halftime, uh, they would allow us to speak to them. And so they asked me if I would, they asked me if I would share my testimony and I did. And that was in the summer of 1997. And I remember several young teenagers accepted Christ as their savior. That first time I ever spoke in front of people. And I got a taste for what would be what God had for me for the rest of my life. You know, the very fact of the matter is. My fence post that I've been standing on for 20 years is only, only possible, first of all, by the grace of God. And nobody gets anywhere, goes anywhere, does anything on their own. Only God, only God could save someone like me or save someone like you. Only God could gift by the Holy Spirit, by his will, those that he would use and uniquely fit them and tool them for the plan that he has for them. That's only God. Only God can do that. So you today, wherever you are in your life, you would hopefully agree with me. It's only by the grace of God. But it's also by the grace of God through people that God entrusts to your life. His grace is shown through people. And I've been reminded about that over the last 12 hours or so. And last night I had a wonderful dinner with pastor as well as JC and Denny men from the church in West Virginia, men that were instrumental, literally, in the shaping of my first few moments and days and weeks as a Christian. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that there are people that have poured into my life and you should be thankful too. You should be thankful that there have been parents or teachers, or in your case, specifically today, a pastor that poured his life out on Sundays and every day in between at various events to shape and mold our Christian experience for the glory of God. We are blessed, aren't we? I'd like to invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn to the book of 2 Timothy Chapter 2, I understand that there's no evening service tonight, so we'll do our best to give you a double dose this morning, okay? Uh, I'm just kidding, okay? We'll, we'll be brief. I've chosen 2 Timothy chapter 2 for four reasons. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I think, is the greatest picture of what a man of God should be. I believe 2 Timothy chapter 2 is a picture of what your pastor is and has been. Secondly, I remember distinctly in May of 2001, some four years after I got saved, that I stood in the same auditorium that I professed Christ four years before and was ordained into the gospel ministry after graduating from college. And the preacher that day, Dr. Steve Hankins, preached... From the same verses that I'm going to share with you this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Thirdly, this passage is a challenge for all of us. Let's not hurry by the sermon or the experience today to think that it was all about pastors and it was all about Christian leaders or it was all about one of those said pastors or Christian leaders. Any description or any goal for any preacher in the word of God is always the goal and mark for every single believer. Remember, when you read that description of the qualifications of a pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, those are not just expectations of pastors. They are expectations of believers. And no one can be a pastor if he is not first a model believer. So as we look at these items this morning, I want you to realize that this is a challenge to all of us, not just those that have been privileged to be called of God to preach his word. And fourthly, this passage magnifies the grace of God. 
And if I were to leave you with one thing this morning that you should walk away with, it should not be how great has been our preacher. It should be how great has been our God and how great has been his grace and how great that grace actually is and what that grace actually means, not only for my salvation, but for all of my life. So we read it together. If you follow along with me in verse number one, for sake of time, we'll just read verses one and two. And then we'll look at some others as we go along. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. May God be praised for his word. I'd like to preach to you this morning only... By his grace. Let's pray, could we? God, thank you for the opportunity to share your words with your people. May my words be swift and clear and used. May we remember this day as a day where Jesus was real and relevant and magnified in our eyes. We love you and pray you these things in Jesus name. Amen. On two occasions, I've had the privilege of strolling through Princeton Cemetery. It is quite a place. If you're a pastor or a church historian, it's uh, quite a memorial garden, if you will. There you'll find the tombstones of Jonathan Edwards, the great revival preacher of the 1700s, buried just next to Aaron Burr, former uh, vice president of the United States, and many other notable pastors, patriots, church, and country leaders. On my second trip, I had already been to Jonathan Edwards' grave and Aaron Burr's grave, and so I quickly looked at those again, and I just wanted to stroll It's kind of odd, I guess, to stroll through a cemetery reading plots on grave sites. But for me, it was interesting. That explains a lot about me. I get it. Okay. But uh, I did. And I, I remember, I I don't remember where, I don't remember what row and I may not ever be able to find it again. If I, if I go back, but I stumbled upon the tombstone of a preacher in those days, there were numbers of men with the last name McLaren. Some of you may have read some of their commentaries in years gone by. There are also a lot of Hodges buried in Princeton Cemetery. But I stumbled upon a McLaren that I had not heard his first name before. He was obviously a preacher. He had multiple letters after his name that indicated theological degrees. And it only said his name, his degrees, his birthday, his death day. And then it said this. He opened unto us the scriptures. I called my wife from Princeton Cemetery and I said, honey, when I die, I want this on my tombstone. Now I'm not making an announcement or anything like that, but I want you to do this. I really do. How staggering, how honoring to this guy that what people said about him and no doubt what he wanted to be said of him and his final statement to everybody who may or may not have known him was that he opened unto us the scriptures. That's exactly what is happening in second Timothy as Paul writes his final words that we will read. He may have written others, but these are preserved and inspired by God. These were written from a prison where just days ahead on the horizon, Paul knew that his life was going to be over. In chapter four, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to, I'm, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that he was about to pull up his stakes and set sail to his eternal reward. And the last thing on his mind was writing to his young preacher, Timothy, a man that he led to Christ in a little town called Lystra in Derby, Twin Cities on Paul's first missionary journey. Timothy was a young 
boy who had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. His parents, his mother and his grandmother taught him the scriptures from the time he was a little kid. His dad evidently had no relationship with God. So when he was saved, Paul stepped in and became that father that he never had, spiritually speaking. And in this text of scripture, like his other writing to Timothy and like his writing to Titus, he's, he's challenging these young preachers about carrying forth the message of Christ to the subsequent generations. And in chapter 2, he summarizes them in at least four generations. And no doubt, Paul had our generation in mind when he wrote 2 Timothy chapter 2. The majority of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy deals with doctrine, first of all, and the preacher, second of all. Titus deals more with church life and what, how we're to function in the church. But Timothy, his letters to Timothy deal predominantly with the preacher himself and the gospel that that preacher has been entrusted with. And Paul is telling Timothy in chapter 2, similar to what he did in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, what the preacher should be like. And yet, interestingly enough, in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, he elaborates it a little bit more than he does in 1 Timothy chapter 4 by providing for Timothy not just the charge to be the kind of man, to be the kind of Christian that he was supposed to be, but also provided with it seven analogies of what the preacher, what the ideal Christian, if you will, uh, should look like and be like. And don't worry, I'm going to skim these at best, okay? And maybe you get a little concerned when you hear a preacher say he's going to give a seven-point outline, right? Uh, I'm not going to give a seven-point outline. I I don't think I actually have points today. Honestly, I'm not really sure what I'm going to say from here, but I will say this. That Paul lays out here in chapter 2, seven pictures for us of what the preacher and what the Christian should be like. And attached to them is a unique challenge. And so in verses 1 and 2, he he tells Timothy that, that good pastors and good preachers and good Christians are stewards. Stewards are people that have been entrusted with great treasure. They're responsible to to steward and invest that treasure wisely so that it can maximize its dividend. In the preacher's case, and for that matter, in the church's case, that investment is primarily the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the investment in is in the lives of people. And that's why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, the things that you have heard among me, that treasure, that gospel, you are to give it to other people. In fact, you are to hand pick certain people that you will pour your life into faithful people that you know will carry that message to others and then to others after them. That's what a preacher is supposed to do. The treasure that we have received in the gospel is not ours to hoard. It's not ours to bury and walk away from. It is ours to share. It is ours to distribute. It is ours to invest in somebody. And I would challenge all of the members of Grace Baptist Church this morning that if you've been given the gospel, it is now yours and it is your responsibility to entrust it and to teach it both to your children, to your grandchildren, to the children in the church, to the younger men and women in the church. It is not ours to remain stale and stagnant amongst ourselves. What's the steward supposed to be with this treasure? Faithful. In verses 3 and 4, he gives the second picture. He says that the preacher is like a foot soldier in God's army. This is not the first and only time that Paul uh, borrows uh, soldier analogies. Uh, He does it, of course, in Ephesians chapter number 6. And in in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he tells him that he is to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. We are to endure hardness as believers. We are not to fold in, cave in, back away, and quit every time something doesn't go our way. I I, I know for a fact that uh, this man that's been in the ministry for 45 years has had multiple opportunities to take an exit ramp. I've been a pastor for three years, and, and I can tell you that I've already had numbers of opportunities to take an exit ramp. But this race and this battle that I am in, it's not mine to quit. 
This job that I have is that God will put me through testing and trouble, difficulty, pressure. Paul describes it greatly in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as part of the job. Preachers do not run from the battle. They go headfirst into the battle and lead other people through the battle. And I would say to you folks, being a believer and being a Bible-believing church does not make you a real friend to our enemy in the world. If it does anything, it puts a rather large target right upon your heart. And folks, what do we need to do? We need to press on. Not only that, we're supposed to avoid any entanglements with civilian affairs. We're to keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what you want to do as a church? Isn't that what your next steps are? You say, what are we going to do? And who's our next pastor going to be? I really don't know, but I know this. I know that everybody in this church can walk away from this lunch in a few minutes and you can take your one foot and put it in front of the other foot and you can keep your eyes on Jesus and keep yourself untangled from things that would distract you from his word and from his will. And you can be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 5, he says, you're like an athlete. Verse 5, and if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. He's supposed to try to win. He's supposed to discipline himself so that he's not disqualified. It sounds very similar to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where we're supposed to uh, run according to the rules. We're supposed to fight according to the referee's expectations. Who in the world gets involved in sports or athletics and doesn't want to win. Whoever says who's winning and you say, I don't care. Nobody does that. I certainly ain't doing that tonight. I've been a Kansas City Chiefs fan for years. It's been 50 years. I'm not going to go, wow, that was a great tie. No. We want to win. And guess what? As a Christian, you've already heard it sung this morning, we've already won. We don't have to fight for victory. We fight because we've already won. And we don't quit and we don't stop and we don't get disqualified until we stand before our great king rewarded for the labor that we put in here. Then in verses 6 through 9, he says, you're like a farmer. You're like a farmer that works hard. A field that is left unattended leads to disaster. Verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. He he gives a description of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verses 7 and 8 as the ultimate sowing and the ultimate reaping. He sowed into his flesh our sin on the cross and paid for it. That body was sown into the ground and three days later it reaped the resurrection harvest. That's the picture that you and I get. Ultimately our sowing is unto the Lord. Ultimately our reaping is is from the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the harvest doesn't always come immediately. When's the last time you planted a plant in your garden and it came up the next day? I've often been reminded that the truth is Most of my joy, listen to me, most of my joy, most of my rest, most of my reward will not be on this side. Most of my rest, most of my reward, most of my victories, most of my joy will be on the other side, friend. And I'm telling you that you should not be laboring for meat that Jesus says that perishes, but you should be laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break through and still make sure that you are sowing properly so that one day you will gloriously reap properly. The next illustration is in verses 14 through 18 where he says, we're like workmen. We're like cloth cutters. We're like skilled carpenters that have as our job the responsibility to take the truth of God and cut it straight to others. We do not have to create our own message as pastors and as leaders and as teachers. We already have a message. We already have a pattern. It's God's word. 
And church, I would tell you, I don't know what all your church will be and I don't know what all it will become, but if I could challenge you about one thing this morning, I would say to make sure that you stay true to this book right here and make sure that the word of God is the center of all that is done. Come on, of all that is said, of all that is believed, of all that is preached and all that matters. And if they don't fall between the lines of that book, then I promise you, friend, it just don't matter. Cut it straight. Be precise. I would urge everyone that is prayerful uh, concerning what will come as a leader of your church. Be sure above all things that you find a preacher that has integrity and loves Christ. And more than anything, loves that book right there and makes that book first and makes it the centerpiece of all that will happen at Grace Baptist Church while Jesus tarries. Then in verses 19 through 23, it says we're all like vessels. That's number six, if you're taking notes. Vessels. In fact, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're called clay pots. You know what that's like? Paper plates. I bet, I bet we're eating on paper plates today. I'm probably wrong. Y'all probably doing something really spectacular. My church, we're eating paper plates, okay, y'all? Unless you're my mom, you don't clean paper plates off, okay? Paper plates are made to be used and discarded. That's what we are. We're just paper plates, but we should be paper plates that God can use. And he says in verses 19 through 23 that we should be vessels fit for the master's use. We should be vessels that are sanctified, that are holy unto the Lord. And how important is it that both in terms of our personal lives and our church as a whole is sanctified and fit for the use of Christ. Finally, at the last three verses of the chapter, he says we're like servants. That's what we really all are. That's what we should be. A slave, somebody does not have a will of his own, somebody who has no agenda outside of the agenda of his master, selfless. I have no time to develop those any further, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to back up to verses 1 and 2 and just share with you in conclusion what I really think that is the fuel, is is the fire, It is the requirement of all of these folks. You can't just go out of this place and just decide, I'm going to be a slave, an athlete, and a worker, and a farmer. I'm going to do the very best that I can. The very fact of the matter is, you can't do that on your own anyways. So in verses 1, as he introduces this this great and, 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 and magnificent responsibility to be this kind of person, Paul says, I want to tell you how this is all going to be done. In verse 1, he says, I want you to be strong in the grace of God. I want you to fill yourself up with the grace of God, which will provide the strength for you to do everything that you need to do. So I leave you this morning with just a few statements, if I may. Number one, it is only by the grace of God. What is grace? It is the free, undeserved favor of God. You say, how do you know if I'm undeserving? I know you're undeserving. Everyone is undeserving. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Hey, there's only one way that a holy God, come on. There's only one way that a holy God is going to interact with you. And that's by grace. It's only by his grace. Max Lucado said grace is God's best idea. His decision to ravage us with love, to rescue us passionately, to restore us justly. What rivals grace? Of all his wondrous works, grace, in my estimation, is the magnum opus. Philip Yancey said, grace does not depend upon what we have done for God, but what God has done for us. Somebody help me up here. Ask people what they must do to get to heaven, and most people will reply, be good. 
Jesus contradicts that answer. We don't have to be good to go to heaven. All we got to do is be humble enough to ask the only one that can get us there. Grace. Listen, when you get to heaven, you won't be singing how great you are. That's exactly why God says in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you are saved through faith. Listen, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. Hey, my boast is not in me and not what I have done and not what I have achieved and how many sermons I have preached. My boast is in Jesus and that cross and that blood and that resurrection on my behalf. It's grace, saving grace, strengthening grace. He says, this grace will make you strong. This grace will make you all that you need to be. The word grace is gift. It is not just God's salvation gift. It is God's enabling gift. It is God's gift to make you strong. You ever been there, friend? Or am I just talking to myself this morning? Have you ever been there when you were so broken, you didn't know where to turn, and you were so sorrowful, you didn't think you could cry another tear? And what was it, friend, that picked you up and pieced you back together and filled your heart with joy, unspeakable and full of glory? And what was it that helped you put your foot in front of the next and move on down the road when you didn't think you could move another step. It was the grace of God. Be strong in His grace. It's only by His grace. We endure by His grace. Verse 2 tells me there's not just enough grace for me. There's enough grace for you, your kids, your grandkids. Come on. There was grace for Grace Baptist Church in yesteryear. There was grace for Grace Baptist Church in this year. And there'll be grace for Grace Baptist Church as long as Jesus Christ tarries his coming. Because Paul says, entrust this message to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. That's what your preacher has done. That's why I'm here. I have sitting in the front row with me, Brother Dallas. He's a member of my church. And guess what he is at my church? He's an intern at my church. And guess what we're doing at my church? We're training him. Why? So he can go pastor a church in a few years. And we're going to keep doing that. Why? Because that's what God tells us to do. And here's what God tells us to do. Train others who will train others who will train others. And I've got enough grace for all that boy the future's bright as grace comes from Christ Jesus who is is he not the same yesterday today and forever I strolled through here and reminded myself the fields named after Dr. Bob Kelly out here and I've got sermon notes of Dr. Kelly hanging in my office. I loved him. Some of you were here. I talked to Bob before the service and he reminded me he'd been here 28 years, I think it was. And I thought, well, he was here when there was grace in that day. And he's been here, come on. He's been here during grace in Pastor Eggerdahl's day. And if God gives him health and strength, he's going to be here for grace in the next day. Oh, listen, God's still calling preachers. God's still training preachers. God's, y'all ain't hearing me today. God's still saving kids and grandkids. God's still rescuing people from bad marriages and broken lives. God's still in the saving business. He's still in the working business. He's still in the training business. He's still in the grace business. He's in the future of every good church that proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. Grace is rewarding. In verse number two, the reward is others. In verse number five, the reward is a trophy. In verse six, the reward is the fruit of the harvest. In verse 10, the reward is the future salvation of all those who have accepted Christ as their savior. It's rewarding. How many of y'all agree with me? God's been far better to you than the devil ever could have been. And this life of grace is the life 
to live. My grandpa used to tell me I'd be a Christian if there wasn't even such a place as heaven. Some of us have got this so confused. We think that all this was about was getting saved so that we could go to heaven. Unfortunately, you're missing out on a whole lot of blessings between now and then. There is a between now and then, you know. And the between now and then is a rewarding life. Hey, there ain't no reward out there doing your own thing, living your own way, messing things up the way that God intended them to be. Oh, but there is great reward for those who will sow in grace and they will experience grace and they will follow grace and they will be disciplined by grace and they will love grace and they will live grace and they will experience the reward of grace. Finally, grace will lead us home. The Bible says one day you're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Thank God you ain't going to be walking alone. Yea, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You get the picture that in this life, God's goodness in this earth and his mercy in this earth have walked beside you like friends, haven't they? Y'all ain't even listening to me this morning. If we was in Jacksonville this morning, they'd be swinging from the ceiling by now. Goodness and mercy are God's earthly companions. They walk with you hand in hand. Oh, I could stand here for the rest of the night and tell you about God's goodness and about God's mercy along the way. He's enlarged my steps so my feet wouldn't slide. He's watched out for me when I wasn't watching out for myself. He's been good to me when I didn't deserve it every step of the way for 23 years. And frankly, even long before that, while he watched over me so I didn't split hell wide open. And I think of the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the mercy of God that have carried me all these days. And one day, they're going to walk me right up to the brink of the Jordan River. And I'm going to cross, but I ain't going to cross alone. Because he's going to be with me in the valley of the shadow of death. And he's going to carry me right on to the other side. You see, grace will lead us on through many dangers, toils and snares. I have already come. It's grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. May God be praised for his word. Let's pray together if we could. Just a few moments, we'll gather for some fellowship, but I believe it would be fitting for us to respond to God's word before we leave. So I ask you a couple questions this morning, if I could. How many of you would say, by the grace of God, I know that I am saved? Would you lift up your hand with me? By the grace of God, I know that I am saved. And I hope with that raised hand, you could take your other hand and point your finger to the Bible and show me that you know from the Bible that you're saved. Is there somebody here that could not say that with us this morning? Maybe you're here today and you have no idea what the grace of God means. You, you say you sound like you're celebrating death up there. Well, for the Christian, it is not death to die. Death is a promotion. And you may be here today and you may not have that assurance in your heart. Well, guess what? You've come to the right place because last time I checked, grace hadn't run out yet. Is there someone here today that say, Preacher, I do not know Jesus as my Savior. I do not know that heaven is my home. But I would like to know that. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand high enough that I could see it? Could I pray for you? Preacher, that's me. I don't know that for certain. I'd like to know, but I don't know. I'll entrust God's sight to what I cannot see. How many of you say, Preacher, I want to carry on in the grace of God. I want to be that picture of what God laid out for us in 2 Timothy chapter 2. God spoke to my heart. I want to be one of those staple people at Grace Baptist Church of God will help see me through so that our legacy can live on for our children, our grandchildren. How many say God spoke to my heart this morning? Would you hold your hand up high? God spoke to my heart. Praise his name. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. Brother David is going to sing a song of invitation. I want to invite you as my brother sings. 
to just come today. Maybe you want to come with your family. Some of you leaders of your home should gather your family around and say, folks, our preacher's retiring, but God's on his throne. And we're going to carry on. We're going to be here next Sunday. And we're going to see God do a great work. So I want to invite you to come and pray with your family by yourself as God leads while Brother David sings. And then our preacher will close our time this morning. Preacher. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender.